Thank you, choir. That's kind of your New Year's gift to us. Bach, one of his most famous great piece. It's great to see you this morning. We are starting a new series. It's, it's a sermon series on a s- section of scripture that I've never preached on before. It's the last half of the second chapter of Luke. Verse 20, we find Mary holding the baby in the manger and she's pondering, the shepherds have been there, she's pondering all these things in her heart. And then verse 21, we're gonna start today. In your bulletin, I've got 21 through 52, I think. It's to the end of the chapter. I was gonna read it all today so you'd have context for this. And I thought, no, it's too much. So I'm going to ask you to go home and read verses 21 through 52. I'm only gonna read four verses today. Will you do that? It's just half a chapter. I mean, it's just half a chapter. Go read all of it because we're going to work our way, four sermons, we're going to work our way through those 30 verses uh, today and over the next three weeks. We're going to see what we can learn about how to live a spiritual life from the commitments that Mary and Joseph made the Holy Family beginning right there at the very beginning. Now let's stop and uh, ask this question. He was the most famous man who ever lived. There are... Uh, depending on which statistic you um, trust, approximately two and a half billion Christians in today's world, all of them following Christ. 1.8 billion Muslims. A lot of you didn't know this. Go to the library and check out the Koran, and you will discover that Muslims believe in Jesus. They speak highly of Jesus. He was considered a prophet, not the Son of God, but Muslims, 1.8 Muslims believe in Jesus. So that gets you up to uh, 4 billion people or so, easily the most famous person who ever lived. But what do we know about him? Especially this morning, what do we know about Jesus before the age of 30. Most famous person who ever lived, and yet we know very little about him. Good, I'll do a little teaching this morning. From secular sources, there are two primary secular sources that are important. A Roman senator by the name of Tacitus, Cornelius Tacitus, I think was his name, wrote about Jesus. So we know from him that Jesus lived and died a violent life, that he was important at his particular moment in history. And even secular historians, not necessarily Christians, believe that that reference to Jesus, and one made by a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus, uh, there's no doubt even in the minds of most secular historians that Jesus lived and died a violent life and influence on a great many people. But no information about the child Jesus. When we look at our religious writings, there's what we call non-canonical literature. There is especially what is called the Gospel of Thomas. If you've ever really studied in detail, in depth, the, the Bible, maybe you've run across this. The Gospel of Thomas has stories about Jesus as a small child, but some of them are fanciful. When they put the Bible together, they decided, nope, this material is not, is not reliable, so it didn't make it into the, into the Bible, into the New Testament. That leaves us with the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Gospel of John, written in Greek, starts with, in the beginning was the Word. There's no nativity story in John. It goes straight to John the Baptist. The same with the Gospel of Mark, our briefest Gospel. It starts with John the Baptist. That leaves Luke and Matthew. We're narrowing down here, aren't we? Matthew has one story about the baby Jesus. It's when Mary and Joseph get up and go to Egypt in order to avoid the wrath of Herod. I won't tell that whole story. You can read that if you want to. But that's the only story we have about young Jesus. That leaves us with these 30 important verses, beginning in verse 21 through verse 52, I believe, to the end of uh, the chapter 2 in Luke. That's all we really have that we we know about young Jesus. And yet, it is a very, very rich section of Scripture. And we're going to mine it for insights over the next four weeks. Today, let's look at the first four verses. After eight days had passed, it was time to circumcise the child. And he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the time came for for their purification according to the law of Moses, we bolded that according to the law of Moses. We'll come back to it. They went to Jerusalem, to the place of the temple. They went to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. 
It is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male shall be designated as holy to the Lord. And they offered a sacrifice according to what is stated in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A baby changes everything. I am, of course, just telling you what you already know. If you've not had firsthand experience of this, you already know it by looking at the lives of family members or friends who've had a baby. And of course, it happens in lots of different ways, but this is a kind of an example that would be familiar to a lot of you. You grow up and you're in, you're in your 20s, you meet the boy or the girl of your dreams, you're attracted to one another, you start to date one another, you grow closer, so there comes a moment when you feel like you're in love, you get engaged, you become married, and life is really, really good. You move from two apartments into one apartment or from two houses into one house, and so the cash flow going out goes down, you've got more discretionary money than you've ever had before. You've got discretionary time. It's the two of you. So when spring break rolls around, you both take vacation from your jobs. You go to the Bahamas. Life is really, really good. And then because you're in love, there comes a moment when you say, well, let's consider having a family. Let's have a baby. And, and you make the decision to have a baby. And that day comes. It's so exciting uh, where, the, you know, yeah, we're pregnant. We're pregnant. And then comes the months of waiting, and it's real exciting, except there comes this moment when it's really close, and you realize, uh-oh, now everything is going to change. Everything is going to change. You start thinking about decorating that nursery, and you start buying furniture, and you say, oh, all the discretionary money we had available to us, we don't have that anymore. And then you start thinking about spring break, and you say, oh, no, we don't have any discretionary time anymore. You know that everything changes when you have a baby. And maybe what is most significant at all, if you're thoughtful parents, is that you start thinking about how will we raise this child? What kind of commitments will we make in our personal lives, in our communal lives, because of this child? What are the things that we will stop doing and the things that we will start doing because we think it will be the richest way in which to raise our daughter or to raise our son? All of a sudden, the light comes on and there are new commitments and new ways of thinking about life. And you know that from that point on, you're going to be living life in a different kind of way. Well, stop and think for me, with me for a moment about Mary and Joseph. That same thing happened, didn't it? I mean, all this is squashed together in, in just one, one chapter, the second chapter of Luke. Please go read it. But uh, we see it there nevertheless. In one moment, Joseph and Mary are at the end of this journey from, uh, uh, from Nazareth to Bethlehem. And, and, the, and the angels have sung and the shepherds are there. And, and Mary, in verse 20, is pondering these things in her heart. And then all of a sudden, in verse 21, things have changed. And they decide on the eighth day to take Jesus to the temple to be circumcised. So the question for you and me is, what kind of commitments did they make? What can they teach us about what it means to live the life of faith because of the commitments that they made? So this is what we learn. They made the commitment to raise their child according to the law of Moses. And the first thing they did was having circumcised because that was important in the law of Moses. So let me say a couple of things. Some of these are specific to time and place. For instance, the decision to have their baby circumcised was important at that moment in the law of Moses, but there came a moment we see it in Acts 15. We've talked about it plenty of times. There came a moment in the Christian church where they said, well, you know, circumcision, not so important. We're not going to require circumcision. 
When you talk about the law of Moses with all the tiny little laws, the dietary laws that you follow every single day, there came a moment when this baby would grow up to a man called Jesus and he would break the law. He would take his disciples and walk through the cornfield. They'd pick corn on the Sabbath, violating the law of Moses. And so there's no doubt that they decided to raise Jesus according to the law of Moses. But in terms of the big picture, this is how I would describe the commitment that they made. They said, we will raise this child in a disciplined life, guided by the traditions of our faith community. We're going to be intentional. There's going to be discipline about how we live our lives, and we're going to be guided in that discipline by our faith community. And next week, we'll talk about the importance, Anna and Simeon, and the importance of that faith community. So this is the question that came to me as I was reading this text and and contemplating it over the last two or three weeks. What does it mean within the life of faith to say that we're going to live a disciplined life? A disciplined life. I will say to you that I've struggled with that question really all my life. I'm a child of the 60s. I came of age in the 60s. We didn't believe in much discipline in the 60s. We believed in freedom and liberty, right? What does, it, what does it mean to say, I'm going to commit to a disciplined life? Does it mean that I'm going to live a Spartan life? Does it mean that I'm going to live a life that is so scheduled, so minutely scheduled, that it will become a life that is rigid? Does it mean that I'm going to live life without any sense of spontaneity or joy or vitality? These are really good questions. This tension between the life of freedom that Jesus promises that comes to us in the life of following Christ and the life of discipline that says, this is how we will do things. After years of struggling with this, I have a definition that works for me, and I'll try it with you. Living the disciplined life is nothing more and nothing less than practicing what you believe. It is practicing what you believe. So Mary and Joseph, when this child is born, they said, we're going to live a disciplined life. We are going to practice what we believe as Jewish people within the community of faith to which we belong. So when we talk about the disciplined life, let me just say to you that to some extent, every single person in this sanctuary today lives a disciplined life. Because you practice what you believe. And I'll just give you a simple, almost a silly example. I'm willing to bet that every single person in this sanctuary this morning, sometime before you came to church, brushed your teeth. If you didn't, you should have. (laughs) Go go home and brush your teeth. And, and, And the reason is this, look. Did you brush your teeth because you've made a commitment to a disciplined life? No, you brush your teeth because of what you believe. You believe in dental hygiene. Or at the very least, you believe that if you don't practice good dental hygiene, it will lead you to a seat in a chair in front of a person who is going to make you hurt and charge you for it. It will be painful and costly. And so you believe in dental hygiene. You believe in it so much that brushing your teeth has become a practice, which has become a habit, that you no longer even think about it, right? You no longer even think about it. It's just what you do every morning. To some extent, we all live disciplined lives. The same would be true for those of us who go to work on Monday mornings or those of us who go to school on Monday morning. You really don't think about it. You get up in the morning and you go to work or you go to school. And the reason is that you believe that working is important. Or at the very least, you believe that receiving a paycheck is important, right? And our children go to school because they think education is important. Because you've told them that education is important. They come home. As soon as they get home and they get out their papers and they start doing their homework because they... Well, scratch the part about the homework. Uh, But you see what I'm trying to say. The disciplined life is nothing more than practicing what we believe. So some of you are disciplined in this way. 
you believe that the practice of exercise on a regular basis is important to your health and to your vitality. Nobody gets up and exercises on a regular basis every week unless they've arrived at that conclusion that somehow practicing, exercising is important to your physical and perhaps even your mental and spiritual vitality. And so you get up and Monday through Friday or Monday, Wednesday and Friday, you go to the gymnasium. You do it because you believe in it. What you believe has turned into a practice. Maybe it's even become a habit about what you no longer even think. Last week, I think it was last week, Denise Peckham was talking about New Year's resolutions and she said, you know, I don't, I don't really, I don't do New Year's resolutions. I happen to know that she is a very disciplined person. But she said, I don't do years, New Year's resolutions. They're not, they're not important to me. Some of you do, some of you don't. So it doesn't make any difference to me whether you do New Year's resolutions or not, but I'll give you a hint here. Here's an example of how not to do a New Year's resolution. To say, beginning on January the 1st, I'm going to lose weight in the new year. You might as well not even make a resolution at all. It's to say, that's not a resolution. It won't work. To say, in the new year, I'm going to exercise more. That's the, that's the surest way. That's the surest way to fail at your resolution. If you want to make a New Year's resolution, I encourage them myself. If you want to make a New Year's resolution, this is what it would look like. Beginning at 7 o'clock a.m. on Monday, January the 8th, I'm going to get up and put on my sneakers and I'm going to go outside and I'm going to spend 20 to 30 minutes walking or jogging. And I'm going to do that Monday through Friday or I'm going to do that Monday, Wednesday, and Friday every day. Every day or every other day, Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. And I know that the first day I go out there, I might only spend, uh, I might only go maybe a quarter of a mile. And maybe the first two weeks, I'll only make it a quarter of a mile, maybe just walking, jogging a little bit. But maybe after a month, I'll be making it a half a mile. And after three or four months, if you've really made a commitment to it because you believe that exercise will make you more joyful and make your life more vital and make you healthier. Maybe after three or four months, depending on how young you are and how athletic you are, you might be making a mile or a mile and a half. But that's the only way you do it. You say Monday through Friday, I'm going to get up 30 minutes earlier. In 30 minutes, I'm going to go outside and walk or jog every day or every other day. The life of discipline is nothing more than practicing what we believe. So let me ask you this question. What does it mean in your life to say that I believe in God? What does it mean in your life to say, I believe in God? I believe in being a follower of Jesus Christ. What does it mean in your life to say, I know that God created me, that God weaved me together in the womb of my mother. I know that God loves me. I know that God has purpose and meaning for my life. What does that mean? Those are the kinds of statements that we profess, aren't they? And let me put it this way, does it mean anything if you aren't practicing your belief in some way or another? What does it mean to practice your faith? What is the spiritual discipline which is the fruit of the commitment of the beliefs that you have made? Those are pretty confrontational questions, aren't they? I, I've been thinking about this a lot. I mean a lot. 
And here's what I have always believed. I have always believed that relationships are dynamic rather than static. And by that, this is what I mean. If you're in a relationship with somebody, your relationship is always changing, which means either it's always getting better it's already, or, it's, or it's, it's either it's getting better or it's getting worse. That you're growing closer to this person or you're growing further away from this person. So let's think in terms of marriage, for instance. You have a commitment to a person to whom you are married. And that relationship is dynamic. Either you're growing more and more in love or you're growing more and more distant from one another. And I was thinking about this this past week and I thought, is it the same thing true in terms of our relationship with God? If you have a relationship with God, it's dynamic, isn't it? It's not just sitting around static, not every changing. You're either growing more in love with God or you're growing further from God. You're growing closer to God or you're growing farther away from God. Now look, I, I've said that with such conviction, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a wrench in this. Because I kept thinking about that and I thought... You know, I'm not really sure I'm right about that. For instance, our relationships with other human beings, sometimes they are just static, aren't they? I I got to thinking about my own marriage. Every married person in here, I think if if you've been married for any length of time and you've not experienced this, you've had a, a remarkable ride. It's a remarkable journey because this is kind of the nature of marriages, isn't it? We go through these periods in our, in our marriages where things aren't really good, but they're not really bad either. They're not changing, it's just static. You're not growing closer to your husband or your wife, but you're not growing further away. Things aren't really good, but things aren't really bad. You're not moving towards divorce, but there's not any kind of real marital, marital bliss. Married, that happens to relationships, doesn't it? You know it happens in relationships. And here's what happens when, when we go through a time like that. We just accommodate the other person. Somebody say, how are you doing? Oh, we're doing great. We're doing great. You've got a spot for this other person in your life, but it's not really a vital spot. You just accommodate them. You tell me if I'm wrong about this. Isn't that what we do with God most of the time? Most of us, me too. Our relationship with God just becomes static. We accommodate God. And so if the Pew Forum people come around with a survey and they say, you know, uh, 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 do you go to church? You say, of course I do. And you're thinking in your mind, of course, I go to church several times a year. If they say, do you have a vital spiritual life? You say, of course I have a vital spiritual life. I pray every now and then. If I'm on the freeway and things are clogging up and I say, dear God, get me out of this mess. (laughs) You say, of course I. But the truth of the matter is, you're just accommodating God. Your relationship with God is not growing. You're not growing closer to God. You're not growing further away from God. You've just got a place for God. That's how it is. And you know why I'm telling you this, because this is where we are in America today, isn't it? This is where we are in America today, and you can see it everywhere. You can see it in the person that says, well, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. But you can see it in our politics, and you can see it in our civil life. You can see it in our social life. And I'm not saying that it's just about Christians. America is a lot bigger than just Christianity today. But I think what a difference it might make if those Americans who are Christians were to, were to rediscover what it means to have a vital relationship where God makes a difference. But the truth of the matter is, it's always, it is always so personal. It starts with you. And with me, and with the commitment to simply practice what we believe. What is the spiritual discipline that reflects the fact that you believe that God created you? That God loves you? That God loves you in this life, and that God will love you in the life to come?
we open up this remarkable chapter, Luke 2, and we turn to verse 21, and we see the commitments that Joseph and Mary made. Ah, oh, this is an important moment in our lives. What are the commitments we will make? What is the disciplined life that we will attach ourselves to? And they say, yes, we will raise this child according to the beliefs that we have. We will live a disciplined life and raise him inside of the community of faith to which we owe our understanding of who God is in our lives. What difference would it make in your life and mine if we were to be like Mary and Joseph and say, yes, now's the time to live a disciplined life, to practice what we believe, and to discover the joy that comes with a vital faith. Thanks be to God.